Hey guys, we're rolling now. So welcome to Rev Up Week <laughs> Five. Today we're going to be talking about purchase sale contract. This is just about the residential purchase sale contract. Um, I'm going to move kind of fast, but um, I want this to be open dialogue. So again, feel free to um, speak up if you have questions. But we're going to kind of go through the whole purchase and sale. I'm going to lean a lot on Sarah because she reviews more purchase and sale agreements than um, anyone I know. And so. Um, but I really want to be able to answer any questions you have. So um, let's just jump right in. Um, and again, if you're watching this and you've been doing real estate for a while, you probably know a lot of this, but hopefully we can talk about some stuff that uh, maybe you, you were not aware of. Okay, line one, top left, that's the date of the purchase and sale. This is really important. Um, I see a lot of people make this mistake. This date is a reference date. This is to reference every other addendum that goes in this contract, right? So um, this date never changes. If you write an offer today and you send it tomorrow, it's still you can have today's date here because it is a reference number and it shows any addendum that has that reference number with that address and the buyers and sellers, it's all connected. If you had a different date than what's here in the top, top left on any other addendum, it's not contractual because it's, that's what connects it. Um, right. So if you wrote an offer for a listing and then they didn't accept it and a month later, you write an offer for the listing again, you want to do a new date because it's a brand new offer. Okay. MLS number is obvious. Offer expiration date um, can be whatever you want it to be as well. Buyers, sellers, this part's pretty obvious. Ooh, I'm going to jump in already. Um, Go for it. Also good to know, you don't, do not technically have to have an expiration date. You can leave that blank because there's a default built into the contract. And sometimes I see brokers use this and they almost always get their deals accepted. So good tip. Thank you. Um, one thing I see people miss quite often and it just makes more work for you. It's not like an actual con contractual error. It's just going to make more work for you is right here where it says buyer status. Um, you have to say if they're an individual, an LLC, a uh, married couple, married buying property separately. Um, Cause if you don't, then the escrow company will need an addendum later stating how they want to take title. So save yourself some time later and put it in here. Um, Item four, this is really, really, really important and also not normally applicable. It will automatically put in the parcel number, but if you are buying, a, writing an offer for a property that includes additional lots, you have to include them here. Just putting the address, the um, address for the property won't do it. You have to have, like, if it's set, I just, I bought a property last year. I had two parcels, 1701 and 1705 South 35th Street. That, that's not good enough. I had to put that parcel and that parcel, and you could really screw your buyer over if you forgot to put in the other parcel number. So that's very important. Make sure you add the extra parcel numbers. If there's more than three, add in a separate addendum. Item number five, five included items. This is obvious on the, um, when you're looking at a listing, it will tell you what included um, appliances are there. You can also check the other box and include other things um, if there are any, you know, if you wanna include a, a lawnmower or something. Um, purchase price is obvious, earnest money. Um, this is hard because it's like how, how much detail do you go into? Everybody knows what earnest money is. Um, a couple couple quick reminders. If you want to have, if you want to be the buyer to be able to choose if they want to do a check or wire, you can click the other box and do check or wire, anything like that. Uh, generally, earnest money is about 1%, but the more money you can get your buyer to put down on earnest money, the better your offer looks. The standard for delivery date is two days. It says that um, right here in section B of the form 21. Um, so if you leave it blank, it's two days. If the buyer is going to need more time, make sure you put it here. Um, this is really important. Um, Sarah and I, we were just audited and I'm going to be sending this, sending out updated policies and procedures, but really important. If your buyer delivers earnest money late, or even if the you represent the seller and the buyer delivers, delivers earnest money late, the contract is avoidable, meaning either the buyer or seller can back out any time. So we don't want that. And in fact, it's a um, contract violation. So if earnest money is delivered in, not in the timeline specified on line seven, you need an addendum stating that both parties agree that earnest money um, is to be delivered at this date as opposed to the date that was on the form 21. Um, and um, this could be a, a fine from the Department of Licensing. And we'll, so we'll be definitely calling this out um, if there is, if this, if earnest money is delivered late, even if you are representing the seller and it wasn't your fault, it's still, we still need that addendum. Um, and then lastly, 
We do not, as a buyer, as a real estate brokerage, we do not hold earnest money. Some brokerages do. So it's almost always going to be the closing agent, which is the escrow office. Really important line number eight, always, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to say always select forfeiture of earnest money if you represent the buyer. The reason is if you select seller's elections of remedies, seller's election of remedies, that means that if your buyer backs out for a reason other than what they have a contingency for, then the seller can get their earnest money and sue them for additional damages. So really, really important to always check forfeiture of earnest money because then we're saying worst case, if the buyer backs out for no reason, um, for a reason other than what they have on the uh, for uh, contingencies for, the worst case is they're going to lose their earnest money and nothing else. So that's very, very important. Generally, in a hot market like this, the seller picks uh, title and escrow. So on line nine, you're gonna put the title company that the seller specified. Line 10, you're gonna put the escrow company that the seller specified. And then you don't need this, it says optional. This is where you'd put if there was a specific closer. So Fidelity Title, Fidelity Title, Lisa Hayes, for example. Please do put it if you can, it is so helpful. It really is. Yeah. And if you're listing a property, please specify who you want as the closer. It's really frustrating when you are trying to send a contract to the escrow office and you don't know who to send it to. So yes, pro tip. Um, closing is obvious. You're going to pick the closing date, talk to the lender or the buyer to see how quickly they can close. And also talk to the listing broker to see when the, the seller would like to close because that can help make your offer more attractive. Possession date, the default is closing. But if you want um, possession to be before closing or after closing, you can put it here, other. Um, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, if, um, what if you're doing a contingent offer? If you're writing an offer that's contingent on the buyer selling their home, how do you do line 11? Um, so the way I believe it's supposed to be used is that you would put in some sort of date. Um, it, there are several different types of contingencies. So let's say you have a 22Q and you're already under contract, then of course you would already know the date. Um, if you're doing a 22B, you wouldn't know because you still have to list your property. And honestly, I'm thinking maybe I have those backwards, but um, either way, uh, what I typically see is you just put a date in here that seems reasonable. No less, there's the bit about no less than 30 days, no more than 60 days. And then the addendums supersede this so it really doesn't matter what you put there because it'll be overridden by the addendums covering contingency does that make sense I, yeah that's it that's how I, I i leave it blank but I, it doesn't matter i guess is my point you can put a date in there or you can leave it blank because either way when you have a 22b which is the contingency that states the buyers going the buyer has to sell their home to buy the home um the 22b the closing date specified in 22B, which is specified by them selling their home, supersedes whatever you put here. So you leave it blank if the seller, if the buyer has to sell their home. Or you can put a date in, but the date, it's kind of a waste of time because the dates are relevant. It's whatever is according to the home buyer selling. Yeah, that probably is uh, a better way to go. <laughs> either way, yeah. So in general, you're probably going to say possession is on closing. Um, if the buyer is going to occupy early or the buyer is going to, or the seller is going to occupy past closing, that's where you put other. And in general, um, I like to see C65B or C65A. Those are the early occupancy or delayed occupancy addendums. But some people do just say plus three days or closing on December 12th possession on December 15th. The problem with doing it, that you can do that, it's not illegal, it's just not as safe because there's no rental agreement if you do it that way. And the 65A and the 65B are addendums that protects the owner of the property who is allowing the other person to rent the property because that's essentially what they're doing. Even if they're not paying rent, they are occupying the property that they do not own. And so you want a rental agreement. So. If you are possessing the property after closing or before closing, use the 65A and 60 or 65B, depending on the situation. And um, yeah, I, I highly advise doing that. Well, and a good thing to know about why you want to use those forms is that if you don't use them, um, either buyer or seller, depending on who's staying or going, is uh, 
going to have to use the eviction process to get the other person out if they decide they don't want to leave. So you want to make sure your client is covered. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> where was I? Here we are. Okay. Number line number 12. This is saying that all utilities um, are to be um, paid out of closing um, by the by the seller. That's pretty obvious that you want to do that. The only time you might say waived is if you are writing an offer for a bank owned property or something like that. And you have a buyer who's buying cash and they've got lots of money and they want to make their offer look really attractive. And they're like, hey, we'll take whatever utilities are owed at closing. But almost always you're going to check this box, box saying that we request a 22K and all utilities are to be paid out of closing. Number 13 is similar. It's saying if there are any charges, liens, anything like that um, assessed before but due after closing, um, they are to be paid in full by the seller. So if you're buying a condominium where there is an assessment that's due by the end of 2021 um, for $20,000, you're saying the seller is going to pay that out of their net proceeds, even though it may not be due until after closing. Um, there's other examples. The home actually I was talking about that I bought last year, they owed $18,000 to the city of Tacoma for board up fees. And it, it was ridiculous. And if I hadn't checked that, that would have been on me because it wasn't actually due at the time of closing. It was just, yeah, it was crazy. Anyways, line 14. Um, here's a, here's a good one, Sarah. If they do not have a FERPTA agreement, I mean, a FERPTA addendum, the 22E uploaded the supplements, do you check either box in the 22E, I mean, on line 14, or do you leave blank? Uh, definitely leave it blank because you don't know for sure. And if you assume, you know, there's a little saying about that that I think we all know. So <laughs> best to just not make any assumptions. And you can reach out to the listing broker and specifically request this before you send your offer in, but that might be a pain. You can do it afterwards and just make sure that it's, um, you get initials on it, check it afterwards once you get the 22. Actually, um, my understanding is it's not a um, counter if the buyer, uh, I mean, if the seller, when accepting the offer says that they're not a foreign citizen, it's not a counter. So that you actually don't need initials um, accepting that. That's my understanding. If in doubt, get initials. Yeah, we'll, I'll take your... <laughs> Sounds good. So you can just check it later then. That's even better. <laughs> yeah, so what I do when I don't have a 22E is I, um, when I'm in AuthentiSign, you can highlight something with a high, with a highlighting markup tool. And so I normally will highlight section 14 to draw their attention there and just indicate, hey, please, when you accept our offer or counter offer, check the box that is clickable. Item 15, again, most of the time you're going to click buyer, buyers represented by the buyer's broker, sellers represented by the listing broker. If it is a dual agency, very, very important, you are going to check this box and this box, buyer slash listing broker, dual agent, listing broker slash buyer broker, dual agent. Really important. I think everyone knows this, but it's easy to forget. If I am writing an offer on Lisa's listing, people think, you might think that's not a dual agency. It is a dual agency because Realty One Group represents the seller and Realty Run One Group rep represents the buyer. Yes, I'm helping the buyer and yes, Lisa is helping the seller, but it is a dual agency even if you're not representing the buyer and the seller personally. The brokerage is representing the buyer and seller personally. So you want to have this box check, checked. Um, if you are, are writing an offer on a home where the seller is for sale by owner, um, there's been a few this year in our office where um, a tenant um, comes to comes to the to their friend who's a real estate broker in our office and says, hey, I'm buying a home that I'm renting from my landlord and um, can you represent me? Um, but the seller doesn't want to be represented. You would check buyer's broker represents the buyer and then seller represents, seller represented by unrepresented. That's really important because if you don't do that, then the seller could claim that you're representing them and now you are a dual agent and there's a lot of things and you should be paid for that. If you are representing the seller and the buyer in a situation like that, make sure you check this and make sure you get compensated for that. Addendum line is pretty obvious. This is just where you put the applicable addendums. Um, let's talk really briefly, um, Sarah, you and me about um, how you feel about disclosures being on the addendum. Because um, this is like a hugely debatable thing um, in, in the industry. 
um, things like the 22J. Some people say it's a disclosure and doesn't need to be on the addendum line. Some people say, well, it's an addendum because it's the lead-based paint addendum. Um, 22E is another example. Um, it's more like a disclosure, but some people say, but a lot of people would say, no, it should be on the addendum line. And then lastly, the Form 17. What are your thoughts on those three addendum slash disclosures? Should they be on the addendum line? My understanding of this section is that it's sort of like the index or the table of context tense. So um, there isn't like a right or wrong what, to what you put on here, but definitely anything beyond the ones you mentioned should be on there. I guess 22K would come across as like uh, disclosure too in a way, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, my answer is on... Um everything but the form 17 should be on the addendum line. The form 17 is by definition a disclosure. It is not part of the purchase sale, sale agreement. It has to be, you have to disclose, that's a department of licensing, RCW, um, but the other items are by definition, according to the, um, I mean, what they are, they are called the FERPTA addendum and the lead-based paint addendum. So um, those should be on line 16, but the form 17 should not be there. Builder um, agreements, builder- um, Actually, Sorry, I would argue that the 22E doesn't go on there either because uh, best practices is to not keep it in the contract, but you also have to make sure they get it. So that's a confusing one. But I it think if people don't list it, it'd yeah. probably be okay. Yeah, it's a confusing one. So at, at, I would say um, for sure don't put the Form 17 and the other ones are debatable. So I'm sorry, we don't have an exact answer on that, but that's kind of the nature of this business. Not everything is clear as mud. So um but definitely put anything else that is um, is applicable, right? The 65A and 65B, if there's a rental agreement, if there's a builder's addendum, anything like that, put it here. Um, Cause like Sarah said, this is a table of contents. Um, bottom is pretty self-explanatory. You got the buyer's and seller's signatures, buyer's address, phone number, email. Um, technically, and again, Sarah, feel free to tell me if you disagree. Um, Technically, you don't need these items for a contractual, well, that's that's not debatable. You don't need these items, the address and the phone number and the email for the buyer and seller to be a contractual document. That's true. Um, it's nice when you have those items on here because if you don't, kind of like the status of the buyer, escrow is just gonna call you and say, hey dude, I need this information. So anyways, it's up to you, but if you don't give it to the, <laughs> if you don't put it on the contract now, then you're gonna have to provide it later. So might as well put it on the contract. Agreed. And escrow can't reach out to people if they don't have this information. So you're going to end up getting it for them anyway. Might as well save yourself some work. And I'd have to look at the manual again to be absolutely certain. But I know that for there's one that you do have to have. And I think it's the phone number for seller. Got it. Um, what if there's a 7B though? Um, you should go back in and fill it in. Also, if so, when, as the listing agent, when the contract comes to you, if you need to put the seller's name. If it's not disclosed, it needs to go on the contract, and then uh, you fill in the phone number. Or, yeah, I'll, I'll double check that. Okay, perfect. Um, buyer's brokerage firm, and then our MLS office number. This is going to be different if you're at the Gig Harbor office or Tacoma, Tacoma office. Tacoma office is 9267. Gig Harbor office is 6665. Um, and that's what's going to go there. It should auto populate though in the transaction desk. It's where you put your, you, the buyer's broker's name and your lag number, the firm number, the broker's number, that's your number, and the fax number. We don't have a fax, so I leave that blank. The firm document email for both offices is docs at ROGTK. Please make sure you put that in there. This is the buyer's bro broker's email. That's your email. And you got your license number and your firm's license number. And again, those should be auto-populated, but double check that they are. Okay, this is a part that could take hours to go through. So I'm not going to go through everything. I'm going to skim through it and go through the important things. But I really highly suggest that everybody takes the time at one point or another to read through this contract. It's really embarrassing. I know because this happened to me my first year when somebody asks you a question about section F of the 21 and you say, let me read it. I don't actually know. 
you should have a general idea of what these things are saying and they're not terribly unclear. The other thing to remember, let me show everyone this really quick. When you look up a form, almost all the forms have a forms manual. So you can click right here. I clicked on the form 21. Now I'm gonna click on the form 21 manual. And this pops up. This is so helpful. It's such a great tool. So you can go into the contract and if you have questions about anything, so section 14, you click on that. Oh, I thought it just bounced me right to it. Well, now you can go up to section 14 and it explains section 14 right here. Does that make sense? So this is really helpful because it elaborates on every item on the form 21. So my suggestion is instead of just reading this portion, read this in conjunction with the um, with the forms manual because it explains each item. Okay, so most of this is pretty self-explanatory. It talks about um, section A is very self-explanatory. I'm gonna miss it. Section B is very important. It talks about earnest money and, um, and when earnest money is due and um, how the buyer can lose earnest money and so on. This is very important to understand section B. Section C talks about um, attachments, fixtures. This is very important. It talks about what is included with a sale without putting it on this, the addendum line, and what is not included unless put on the addendum line. Very important to read through section C. Section D is saying that title has to be free and clear unless specified otherwise um, in order to close this deal, like this deal is contingent on that. That was D. And E talks about title insurance. Um, also very important, but it's saying there's standard title insurance policy that is um, that is required and will be handled through escrow, but, you, um, but the buyer and seller are advised to um, potentially look into further title insurance. Closing and possession is really important. This talks about computation of time. It says, hey, if closing is scheduled for a holiday, then it automatically goes the next day. You actually don't need an extension. Really, again, really important. A lot of this is pretty straightforward, but um, really important to read through it. Section G is about 1031 like-kind exchange. This is um, if somebody wants to do 1031 exchange where they're selling a rental property and they want to um, take that money and buy another property, very complicated. You probably don't want to advise your client on this. You probably want to tell them to speak an attorney, but this will give you enough information to be dangerous. Um, closing costs, this specifies what closing cost is paid by the buyer and the seller. Um, title and escrow is automatically, it's agreed upon, agreed upon that it is going to be split, but then things like um, applicable FHA and VA um, fees, who pays for that automatically, it specifies everything there. Um, again, these are things that like you probably know for the most part, but you want to read this paragraph to really be able to, I mean, it, it really clearly lays it all out. This is continuing that section. Section I, listing broker and buyer broker are authorized to report this agreement, including price to the MLS. That's just saying buyer and seller give permission to disclose information about this deal, certain information to uh, the MLS. Um, section J, J talks about uh, seller um, being a foreign citizen or not a foreign citizen, which is FERPTA. Section K, that talks about computation of time, uh, notice and delivery of documents and how what con what constitutes delivery. So we've talked about this before, but for a document to be delivered via email, it has to be sent to both brokerages and the other broker. Anyways, that talks about all of that. I is, is talking about, elaborates on computation of time. Um, this is, this I get, I get questions about computation of time all the time and I'm happy to answer questions. I'm not complaining, but everything I'm gonna tell you when you call me and ask about, hey, if it's less than six days, does that include weekends and holidays? I'm just gonna pull up the form 21 and read section I. That's all the answers are right in here. M talks about um, electronic signatures and how that is now legal. Now, as of the past like 18 years, you can do electronic signatures. They don't have to be wet signatures for certain things. Assignment talks about buyer may not assign the property, which means if they say, hey, Isaac Schaefer is buying this property, and then I want to now not buy the property and transfer it to Robin to buy, I have to get the seller's permission. 
D talks about, I mean, sorry, section O talks about if the buyer defaults, what happens to their earnest money. Um, P, professional, this is advising the buyer and seller to seek an attorney um, in certain circumstances. Section Q, the offer must be accepted. Oh, this talks about offer expiration date. This is what uh, Sarah was talking about earlier. The offer expiration date is automatically 48 hours. I believe, isn't that correct, Sarah? Okay, no, it doesn't actually talk about that there, but it does talk about um, that um, offer expiration date is 9 p.m. of the date. It's not midnight. <clears throat> And then this account, uh, section R talks about counter offers. If the seller counters you, um, when does the counter offer expire? Section S, offer and counter offer expiration date. That's essentially concluding between Q and R. Section T, agency disclosure. It's, this is talking about buyer's brokerage firm. Buyer's brokerage firm doesn't need a broker. Buyer's brokerage branch manager uh, represent, represent, uh, and buyers represent the same party that buyer broker represents. This is just, it's a disclosure. This is everything that's in the agency disclose. This is, this is why we don't need an agency um, disclosure addendum anymore. You used to need it, then they added it to the form 21. This is essentially disclosing that you're a licensed real estate broker in the state of Washington. Section U is talking about commissions. This is really important. This is saying that you are going to be paid according to the 1A, but as a buyer's broker, you don't see the 1A. So you're going to be paid according to what is listed on the MLS. If you want to be paid more than what's listed on the MLS, if the MLS just says that the seller is paying no commission, or you want to be paid more than the 1% commission that they're offering to the buyer's broker, you need to specify that in a Form 41C. So that's really important. Section V is talking about uh, lead-based paint. W, this is a really important portion of the Form 21 and kind of a good loophole for buyers. It says buyers shall have 10 days after mutual acceptance to verify all information provided by the seller or listing broker firm related to the property. So anything on the form, on the uh, MLS, if you find out within 10 days of mutual acceptance, oh, they said that there is gas at the property and there's not gas at the property, the buyer can use that to back out and get their earnest money back. A lot of people in a hot market like this are crossing out section W saying, hey, we're good. We're waiving our right to revoke our offer um, if there is inaccurate information on the MLS. And section X is talking about the condition of the property. Buyer and seller agree that except as provided in the agreement, all representation and information regarding the property and transaction are solely from the seller or buyer and not from any broker. So this is a CYA um, clause that says, I am the buyer's broker or I'm the listing broker and I am not responsible for um, the square footage listed on the MLS or responsible for disclosing certain um, information about the property. Actually, I said that wrong. I'm not responsible for, um, I'm not warranting anything that I that um, is listed. It's, um, I am facilitating this transaction. It's essentially just a CYA. Okay, that is the form 21. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough please take the time to review these, um, each, each item and, um, and feel free to uh, call me if you have any questions about this. It's really important that you understand these documents. Okay, we're just gonna go through some of the most important, uh, most commonly used addendums um, and go from there. So again, you look up the form 22A, this financing addendum, you can click on the form or you can click on the forms manual and this will explain everything I'm about to, I'm about to explain. So section one of the 22A is talking about what type of loan it is. This is where you wanna specify if it's conventional, a VA, FHA, et cetera. Really important here is you have to disclose um, if it's um, a certain type of FHA loan. That's one that comes up very often, right? So if you say it's an FHA loan, that may not be wrong, but you should also say if it's, a, um, um, Andrew, you just went through this, what's it called a um, zero down, um, I guess, I mean, I'm overthinking this, but if it is um, a it's zero down, down payment assistance, right? Payment, that was it, yep. So if it is down payment assistance, you wanna say FHA down, payment assistance. 
This is really important because if you, if it is a type of, if you're saying it's an FHA loan, but you're not disclosing that as FHA down payment assistance, your financing contingency could be waived if the buyer's financing falls through because you did not disclose as down payment assistance. And here, and so what a lot of people, a mistake that I've seen this year a few times is people say it's FHA three and a half percent down, right? That's correct because it is an, F, an FHA down payment assistance loan. Let's talk about what that is really quick because I'm using this as an example. There are other examples, but what that is, is it's an FHA loan for 96.5% of the purchase price. And the buyer is getting a separate loan for 3.5%, which is their down payment. So you still want to say the buyer is putting three and a half percent down, but you want to check the other box and explain that they're using FHA down payment assistance. So that is clear. We are putting three and a half percent down, but we are getting the down payment from down payment assistance. That's really important because it says here, buyer shall, buyer shall pay three and a half percent of the purchase price down in addition to the loan. So you are saying the buyer's paying that. If you don't specify that you're getting that as a loan, your finance contingency could be deemed waived. So it's really, really important to over disclose. Um, the second portion of this paragraph talks about that you have to, as the buyer, apply for the loan for this specific property within five days if left blank. And really important, if you don't, if the buyer does not apply for the specific property within that time, then your financing contingency is waived. So why is this important? If a buyer barely qualifies for a $350,000 home and they find out that, uh, and they go to the lender 10 days later and say, okay, here's the address. And the lender says, dude, this is in, you know, a part of King County where property taxes are higher. You actually don't qualify for this. And you're like, well, sorry, we don't qualify. We're going to back out using our 22A. Well, it's too late. You didn't do it in time. So that's why that's important. Also, the home could be somewhere that has flood insurance. I mean, I'm sorry, that requires flood insurance, which can be 400 bucks a month. And now you may not qualify for that, for that loan. So point being, um, make sure you explain this portion to your buyer and say, as soon as we have mutual, the clock starts clicking for you to make sure you qualify for that specific property. In general, you can solve this problem by going to your lender before you write the offer and say, here's the address. Can you confirm on the pre-approval that they do qualify for this specific address? And then you're good. And because you've, you've applied for that and the, and, and the lender has confirmed it, right? But it, if you're just using a generic pre-approval letter from your lender without an address, you have to go back and get that. And actually that's what section B talks about. If buyer fails to make application for financing for the property within the agreed time, then buyer loses their earnest money if they can't get financing. Okay, section two, there's A and B, you check one. Okay, I'm gonna explain A and then explain B. This is somewhat complicated, but I'll try and make it simple. Section A, you check this box and leave it blank or type in 21 days. It's saying after 21 days, the seller can send a form 22 AR. The 22 AR is the seller saying, buyer, it's been 21 days, waive your financing contingency. And if you don't, you don't have to, but if you don't, the seller can back out of the contract. So that's what that's saying. Um, most of the time sellers don't send 22 AR, but if they do, that's what this timeline equates to. Um, and then section A, uh, 2A3 is saying, if the buyer does waive the financing contingency, that will also waive the appraisal or it will not waive the appraisal. So it'll say, so if the buyer says, yeah, we'll waive our financing contingency, but you check will not, that's saying we're waiving our financing contingency. So if my financing falls through, then we lose our earnest money. But if the appraisal comes in low and thus financing falls through, we don't waive our earnest money. So hopefully that makes sense. I know it's kind of complicated, but I almost always will check will not. If you check will, you're essentially saying if the appraisal comes in low and the buyer can't cover it and they waive their financing, the buyer loses their earnest money, okay? Section B is the same as section A. It's just saying instead of the seller having to send a 22 AR at 21 days, the seller um, automatically at 21 days your financing contingency is automatically waived at that point. So this is risky because you're saying at 21 days, we're sure our financing is gonna be good. So it's automatically waived at that point. 
So make sure before you check one of these boxes, you thoroughly explain what that means to your buyer. And if you want to protect your seller, your buyer and be very careful, check section A and leave this at 21 or even make it a longer timeline. And then always check will not, unless your buyer is really saying they'll pay anything above the appraisal, they just really want this home. Section B is obviously as a seller, way more attractive to a seller, right? And especially will waive the appraisal. That's incredibly attractive to a buyer. It's essentially an unlimited 22 AD. And I guess I'm going to elaborate on that for one second. I just wrote an offer for somebody who had um, a lot of money in the bank and they of course didn't want to pay more. They were putting 20% down on home. They wanted to just put 20% down on the home. Um, but we were offering $19,000 less than the, um, than the list price. And so he's like, okay, I love this home, but I can only pay up to 560. And it was listed at 579. And he said, how, you know, what can we do to make our offer more attractive? And I said, well, how confident are you in your financing? He's like, well, I've been at my job for 30 years. I'm not losing my job. <laughs> okay, cool. Talk to the lender. I said, how confident are we that he qualifies for 560? And the lender said, dude, he qualifies for 840. Like, we're good. He's, his financing is not falling through unless he loses his job or God forbid passes away, in which case we're probably not worried about his earnest money anyway. Sorry, that was morbid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. It happened once actually. I was a part of a transaction where the buyer died and, and they got their earnest money back because buyer's financing fell through. Yeah, it did. Yeah, crazy. Like a lot of things have fell through. So this client also said um, he is going to waive his appraisal. So we literally put here, we did section B, automat we are waiving our financing. We did zero days. I'm not telling people to do this, but I'm just showing people this is one way you can write a crazy attractive offer. We did zero days. And then we did, we're waiving the appraisal. So what that means is we are, we are saying, hey, we're offering you 560. If you accept our offer, our financing contingency is waived immediately. And if the appraisal comes in low, even it com if it comes in at 400,000, we are paying whatever the difference is between the appraisal and what we offered. So in no way am I saying you should do this. But if you have a buyer who wants to be very, very, attractive on their offer, this is a gangster move that can really make your offer stand out. As a set, if I was representing a seller, that's as good as a cash offer. The only thing that a cash offer has over that is a cash offer can probably close a little quicker. But this is essentially saying we have no financing contingency. We're disclosing that we're getting a conventional 20% down. So you still have to use the 22A, but we're waiving it. Like if the finance, if our financing falls through, you get our earnest money. Hopefully that made sense. Any questions about that? I know that's, that's pretty deep level right there. Sarah, any disagreement about anything I said? Just always practice caution. Like, yeah. don't, <laughs> sorry, that was really scary. Uh, <laughs> don't do that unless you're in Isaac's exact scenario that he just described or that you're so comfortable with how the 22A works that you can explain it to other people so that they would be able to use it. So. Yeah, that's yeah, that, what I would say about that. that. Situation, <laughs> after I explained it over the phone, I recapped in an email. I said, here's, here's what we're doing. <laughs> you're waiving your financing. That means that this, like, you're out. And, um, and he responded, good, we're good with it. So I covered my butt there, show, you know, telling him exactly. Yes, yes, do exactly that. Get it, it in writing. writing. <laughs> But, but again, what happened? We got an offer accepted. It had been on the market for eight days. They had no other offers, but we got an offer accepted in this hot market for $19,000 under list price. I think the home was maybe like five, $10,000 overpriced, but I think the seller probably could have got 570. Again, they were listed at 579 and they tried to counter us at 570. And we said, nope, this is our final offer. Take it or leave it. And we got an offer accepted seven or eight days on market for $19,000 less than the list price. And the I spoke to the listing broker. He's like, yeah, dude, it was essentially a cash offer. We had to take it. It was too good of an offer. So it worked. It's very, very, very risky, but it works. Like it's, it's very attractive. It's like waving an inspection. Like, should you do it? I'm not saying you should do it, but if you do do it, obviously your offers can be incredibly more attractive than somebody who has an inspection contingency. So that's all I'm saying there. It's a tool that you can use, but be very, very cautious. Section three, this is where you uh, specify if the buyer wants their closing costs paid or a portion of their closing costs paid by the seller. Um, so you would just check this box if you have a number or this box if you want a percentage. Um, 
What is section four? If buyer has not waived the finance contingency and is unable to attain financing close. Yeah, this is just saying if the buyer's financing falls through, the buyer gets to earn his money back. Section five, this is, um, <laughs> this is like a super common question I get. Hey, what happens if the appraisal comes in um, under list price? What do I do? Um, I have buyer's agents in our office call me and, um, and I, again, you can call me anytime. I'm not complaining that you call me if, if you ever have, but everything I'm going to tell you is right here. Section five explains everything. And I literally was just talking to Robin. I just got noticed today. My buyer's appraisal came in low and I, I've done it enough that I remember what to do, but even today I opened the 22A when I came to my email and I saw that the appraisal came in low. I was like, okay, what do I do? I went to section five and it says, okay, here's what you do. You send them a form 22A in that says, hey, Mr. Seller, the appraisal came in low. Here's a copy of the appraisal and here's our notice of low appraisal. And then this explains what happens. The seller has 10 days to either file for a reappraisal or to consent to a lower price or consent to a price not quite as low as the appraisal, but have the buyer come in with the extra, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, review section five if you get a low appraisal and make sure you follow it to the T because if you send an email to the listing broker that says, hey, the appraisal came in low, that doesn't cut it. Your financing will be waived after three days if you don't do it the proper way. So this is telling you, I keep pointing at my computer as if you guys can see my finger. <laughs> this tells you exactly what to do if the appraisal comes in low. And so make sure if the appraisal comes in low, you follow this to the T. And same with the seller. If you're representing the seller and you get a 22 AM from the buyer, go read through this whole thing. And then again, I'm so help, happy to help you. Like feel free to call me or Sarah and discuss it. If you're confused by anything, I want you to please talk to us if you have questions and, and not make mistakes. But I'm just saying all the answers are right here. And if you had a 22 AD in the contract, please make sure you're using the 22 ADN for notice of low appraisal, it has a section to deduct the amount that you've already said you would pay above the appraisal, something like that. So it has a little worksheet in there. It's the form to use if you have a 22 AD. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. In general, guys, there's a form for everything, almost everything, seriously. So if something happens that you're like, I need a specific addendum for this because it's different than the normal addendum. Call me or Sarah or text me or Sarah and we can help you find. There's probably already an addenda for that and you could be um, violating the contract if you don't use the proper addendum or at least putting your buyer at risk. So always try and find the form that is already made for your specific problem. In general, you're probably not dealing with a problem that hasn't already come up that the Northwest MLS attorneys have not drafted an addendum for. Section six is just saying that the uh, seller gives permission for the lender to do an appraisal um, or any inspection required by the lender. Um, section S is uh, is explaining the FHA, VA, USDA um, loans and it, it's kind of redundant to everything else. Honestly, if you read this, it's very similar to the rest of the uh, 22A just saying, hey, just a reminder, if the appraisal comes in loan and it's FHA, VA, or USDA, the buyer doesn't have to pay more than the appraisal. And it's like, that's kind of what the rest of the 22A says, but for some reason they have to include that again. Uh, same with the VA amendatory clause. I don't know why, but most lenders, even though the VA amendatory clause is specified here, will also require you to use a VA amendatory clause in, um, in order to close, but it's really redundant. And this section nine is really important. If through no fault of the buyer, lend, lender is required by blah, 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 to give correct. Okay, this is essentially saying um, if the buyer can't close in time because something happened to their financing, like, hey, we need an extra week. Um, the seller doesn't have to extend an extra week. The seller can terminate if the buyer can't close in time, even though it's the lender's fault or you know, out of their hands but the buyer gets our earnest money, right? So we say we're gonna close by December 28th, but it doesn't close because financing took longer. The seller doesn't have to extend, but if the seller terminates, the buyer gets our earnest money back. That's pretty much it. Anything you wanna say about 22A before we move on, Sarah? Nope. Awesome. Pretty much covered it. I use the form 22D on think all my offers. I honestly can't think of one that I don't use 22D. 
Yeah, always. And the reason is the first box, if you check nothing else, we'll go through every box, but the first box is saying, listing broker and buyer broker make no representations concerning the lot size or accuracy of any information provided by the seller, blah, blah, blah. It's a CYA. I, that's kind of a vulgar thing to say, but I say it all the time. That's really what it is. It's saying, hey, I'm the buyer's broker. I'm assuming what the seller said about the property is correct. I'm not responsible if the seller disclose something about the square footage that isn't true or anything else. So that's essentially what that's saying. And that's why I always include 22D because that's not for the buyer's protection or the seller's protection. That's for my protection and saying, I'm assuming everything the seller disclosed is true. Title insurance. Um, Sarah, definitely tell me if you think I'm wrong on this, but my, my understanding, as we talked about in the uh, form 21, title insurance is included with any contract um, using the form 21. And um, so you don't need to check standard owner coverage or extended coverage. However, if you want extended coverage, you would check that. In general, extended coverage from what I've heard, I'm going to be careful. I am repeating what I've heard from title experts who I know. Extended coverage is really not necessary unless it's a really complicated property. You're buying a huge plot or you're buying a property that has um, has, a, has, a, has a rough history with... Um, different ownership and, and, um, and it's, it's, things are unclear. It's a little scary. Um, that's where you might want to do extend coverage. Um, and then, um, the, the buyer is normally responsible for that, but here you would say the seller is paying for it. If you check that box, anything you want to add to that, Sarah? No, I, yeah, just this section. I, I don't think I've ever even seen anybody use that. You're covered by the 21. Yeah. You don't need to check section two, First box, you don't need to cover. That's all standard owner coverage is already in place. So you don't need to check it. It's just redundant. Section three, I generally don't check that. I talk to my buyer ahead of time. I say, hey, we're competing against multiple offers. Let's not check section three because it makes our offer just a little more attractive because it's saying, hey, seller, it's okay if you leave the house mess. Make sure you get the buyer's permission before you do that. That's an easy way to make your offer a little more attractive. But um, if the buyer is somebody who wants to make sure they're walking into a clean home with no trash or debris or rubbish, as it says there, uh, make sure you check section three. But that's something that I always encourage my buyers not to check because I'm going to make one more tangent note here. Even if you do check section three, the seller often doesn't clean the property. And then it's like, okay, you're a day before closing, you're doing a final walkthrough and the property's not really clean. What are you going to do? I mean, you could say, well, we're not going to close because the, because the home's not clean. And the seller can say, well, screw you. Then we'll go back to market. And then it just gets into, I've had this happen so many times that I'm just like, the seller's probably going to clean it either way. Cause most sellers are responsible people who are going to do that. And if they don't, you're buying, you're spending $500,000 on a home. I'll pay for a cleaner for $300. You know what I mean? Like if there, if my buyer went into the home, they're like, oh my gosh, this is such a mess. I'd take, I'd pay for it out of my commission if it helped me get this offer. So anyways, take that or leave that. But I generally don't sec check section three if I'm competing because it makes your offer just a little more attractive. I do however check section four because this is just saying that sellers to remove all personal property um, from, from the home. And if they don't, if they leave a lawnmower and they come back to you, two days after closing say, hey, I left my lawnmower and you've already gotten rid of it or sold it or whatever, as a buyer, the seller has nothing they can do. It's like, sorry, that's what section four says. It says, if you leave any property, it's ours. You can't come back for it. Um, and it's also saying the seller can't leave anything, but if they do, that's what happens. Um, section five is just the seller disclosing um, utilities. Really important, if you're in a rural area, I would definitely check the internet and um, specifically the internet one, because nowadays 99 out of 100 buyers, probably more, need internet. I mean, a lot of people work from home. They absolutely don't want to buy a home that doesn't have internet. Rhonda in our office had one recently where they found out after they were pending that there was no internet provider. Literally the only way for them to get internet at that place was like a Verizon hotspot, which did not work for her buyers. So anyways, um, I have been recently, if it's not like, you know, if it's in downtown Tacoma or Puyallup or something like that, it's like, of course there's internet, right? Um, but if it's somewhere that you're not 100% sure, check this. And that's saying, seller, please provide, um, disclose who provides internet in that area. Um, and if they, you know, were to counter back and say <laughs> none, <laughs> then you can back out because um, that would be a counter. Um, okay, cool. If it's new construction, the buyer has to, the seller has to fill out uh, the installation details. 
So that's not applicable unless new construction. That's section six. Section seven is talking about lease property. If there's any lease property um, that they specify in the form 21, you'd click this and you'd say propane tank and or whatever it is. And you'd say the seller shall provide all details regarding the lease within five days. And the buyer can then review the lease and um, terminate if they don't like what they see in the lease. Okay. Um, I think that's that, that's about it on that item. I felt like I was going to say something else. Yeah, I just had a buyer who um, bought a property that had a, a leased water tank. And um, anyways, um, they they moved forward, but he was like, well, I want to be able to see the lease. How much are they paying? Because the seller didn't disclose in the listing how much they were paying for the water heater lease. And so anyways, by clicking section seven, it said you were required to give us lease information. Turned out the water heater lease was six bucks a month. And my buyer was like, cool, I'm good. If there's a homeowner association, you want to check section eight and say the seller has 10 days or less if you change it to give you all the information about the HOA and the buyer has five days to review it and back out if they don't like that. If they don't like what they see. Section nine is saying generally homeowner associations have a transfer fee when you sell a property and it's saying either the buyer or the seller is going to pay the transfer fee, seller if left blank. Excluded items. This is if um, a seller um, has a fixture. Hey, Isaac. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt. Um, before you move past homeowners association, what, with the market being so competitive, do you recommend people if they know there's a homeowners association that they check this regardless? Eight or nine. Um, eight. Okay, so eight. Um, it's complicated. If the seller has... Um, uploaded the CCNRs already, covenants, codes, and restrictions. And my buyer has reviewed them and they're like, yeah, it's cool. They say no RVs and they say, I can't build a fence taller than five feet. And they're like, yeah, we're good. Um, then yeah, you can totally waive that. You don't have to, you're like, we've already seen it. There's nothing about this HOA that, that I have questions about. And there's nothing that's going to change my mind about buying this home. If you have not seen the CCNRs, I would not. Yeah, I would absolutely check section eight. It's very risky because I mean, what if you have a dog and you find out that the CCNR say you can't have a dog over 30 pounds and your dog's 40 pounds? Uh, I mean, that would be catastrophic for most people who love their dog. Well, um, I have a property in HOA and I'm wondering if they cover windows. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Robin's saying, you know, if you have like a condo that you want to know, like what they, what they cover, right? What does, what does my $350 a month cover? If the roof goes out, is that on me or is that on the HOA? It almost always is the HOA, but that's, that's what those timelines are to review. And that's why you want to see it. So if they provide the information, you're good. If it's one of those super simple HOAs in Puyallup that are $15 a month to like maintain the road, you can kind of roll the dice. Well, you can tell your buyer you can roll the dice because there's probably not much in here. You know, you can talk to, to, they know neighbors in the area and they're like, you know, you see RVs everywhere and you see dogs and tall fences and houses painted what other, whatever color they want. Your buyer probably knows, yeah, there's probably no rules against any of that. It's probably a really lenient one, but it's just a risk. To answer your question, Sarah, it's just a risk. If you don't check section eight and you find something in the CCNRs later that your buyer is not okay with, you can't back out. You'd lose your earnest money if you back out. So that's, it's kind of yes and no is the answer to your question. And, say, and section nine, so by use, the way. Use caution. Use caution, yeah. absolutely. Section nine, by the way, similar to section three in the sense that you want to make your offer just a little more attractive than everybody else. Everybody checks this box. Sell it. Almost everybody says sellers to pay the HOA transfer fee. I've never seen an HOA transfer fee more than 450. Obviously, there are are exceptions, I'm sure, but I've never seen one. So I say to my buyer, hey, you're spending half a million dollars on this home. How about we say that we're gonna pay the transfer fee? Cause it's probably gonna be like two, $300, but worst case we're talking $500 probably. And like, that'll make our offer look attra more attractive than probably every other freaking offer out there. Because again, when I'm listing a home with an HOA, with a homeowner association, every single time, everyone checks this. So might as well make your offer that much more attractive. And if it's close, they're probably gonna go with us. Excluded items are talking about fixtures. Those are rooted and attached items at the home. Um, if the seller says in the listing that they want to take home the chandelier in the entry or the rose bush in the front yard, um, the seller is going to put here that information because everything that is rooted or attached to the home does stay with the home unless it is specified here. 
It's really important if you represent a seller to, um, I, this is part of my listing um, appointment with them is I say, hey, by the way, if you have anything attached to this home that you wanna take with you, we have to put that in the listing and make sure we put it on 22D. If Including the buyer- wall-mounted TVs. I thought, so I think the mount is included, but not TV. Uh, oh, I think okay. well, you, we'll you want to be, that one. I want to get back to you guys okay. on that because I argued with someone okay. about that, um, politely argued. Uh, <laughs> I got that okay, from we'll my back to you on advanced that one, real that... estate law is where I okay. learned that. Sarah, you and I are going to debate that and follow up okay. in, the, in, the, um, in the recap. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, Sarah might be right. Sarah's smarter than me on most things. So uh, she might be right. I, I'm i just fussier. Uh, yeah, hey, no, I appreciate it. That, that's what makes you good. <laughs> if the buyer wants the seller to pay a home warranty or if you're buying a home warranty for the buyer or the buyer is just having a home warranty included in their closing costs, you'd add it here. Other box is like the Form 34. Just another tiny quick tip. If you have a little thing that you want to put on the form 34, such as buyer's broker is related to the buyer or such as, um, can't think of another example, but there's obviously plenty. Um, instead of adding another addendum and making my offer look a little more complicated, might as well just put it on the other line 22D because you already have it here, right? I use the form 34 if it's like, if I'm adding a bunch of stuff to it or if I'm adding it after a purchase and sale, but the other is a good place uh, to put things um, instead of a form 34. But that's all that is. It's essentially just a blank addendum. You can put anything there. But I'm going to say this one more time. Don't put anything here that there's already an addendum for, right? You wouldn't say buyer's allowed to occupy the property early. No, you want to use the form for that, right? So make sure you use the proper form if there is a proper form for it. But there isn't a form for buyer's brokers related to the buyer, which you do have to disclose. So that's an example of something I'd put here. Okay, we are out of time. But I'm going to just go a little further, talk about just a few more addendums. The 22K is really obvious. It's just talking about the utilities. The seller's disclosing who the utility companies are, and that's directions to the escrow company to contact those utility companies and um, make sure they're paid. The 22J is saying the seller does or does not have uh, knowledge of lead-based paint, and, um, and the buyer is waiving their right to... Um, inspect if there's lead-based paint or they're not waiving the right to inspect if there's lead-based paint. Pretty simple, but you have to use a 22J if the home is 1978 or older. What's your take on the on the 22K for buyers on checking it at the top? There's a part where, so on page two, the top line, it says that they've received certain information. And according to the MLS, um, it is the listing broker's responsibility to make sure that that's enforced. But I see some people check it, some people don't. What do you say as the boss? Well, so I say that, well, did they just change this form? Which one? 22J, I just clicked on it. Uh, revised date, 321. What the heck? Oh, that's 22J lease. Jeez, I clicked on the wrong one. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, pulling it over. Here we go. So um, what Sarah is talking about is, this is where the seller says they do know or they don't know of lead-based paint. And the seller signs here, buyer initials here, seller initials here. This is saying the buyer has received copies of all information listed above. The buyer has received the pamphlet, protect your family from lead-based paint. I always have the buyer initial that because whenever I'm working with a buyer, I have already sent them the those the, I, I've I've already sent them that information, so I know they can initial it. If you have not sent the buyer the information, then you should be <laughs> send them our disclosure document so they already have it and they can just initial it. So that's really kind of the best answer to that question. Um, I didn't um, I didn't know what you were saying, Sarah about um, that this is the seller's job to provide this. So um, I was not aware of that. So I guess what I would say is if you are listing a home with a 22J, you should also you should add it as a supplement and also add it, add the uh, protect your family from lead-based paint um, pamphlet to the supplements. Is that what you're saying? Sarah? Uh well, mostly I was asking for your take on it because I I see different things. 
Um, well, I did not. Know I wasn't a hundred percent sure on that. I, I, if it is a list, so we'll get back to you guys on this too. This is why these meetings are actually so good because iron sharpens iron, and obviously we're all we're, we're all learning here as we as we talk about it. But if Sarah, Sarah, we can put that in the recap email too. But if lead based paint. If we are as the listing broker required to include um, to to make sure the buyer has received that pamphlet, then yeah, my answer would be um, we'll look into that. And if that is the case, then yes, we should start adding that to the supplements. I wasn't aware of that. So, um, okay. And this is just saying the buyer can waive their right to inspect for lead-based paint, or they can accept the opportunity to um, inspect for lead-based paint. Um. I think the last form I want to go through is the 35 and the 35W. These are pretty straightforward for forms. If the buyer is going to waive the inspection, you want to use the 35W. You do not want to just omit the 35. You want to include this. This is saying, and the, the reason why, this is again, a CYA clause. <laughs> this is saying the buyer has been advised to obtain an inspection and they chose not to. That's what it's saying. And that's why you always want to include this if your buyer is waiving their inspection. If the buyer does a pre-inspection, you also want to include this. And if the buyer does a pre-inspection, they're asking for repairs. Hey, we've pre-inspected it. We're waiving our inspection, but we want you to replace the furnace. You'd click two and three and say seller to replace the furnace. Okay. Um, and then that is if you are waiving your inspection. If you are not waiving your inspection, you're going to use the form. 35. And this is the last addendum I'll go over and then we'll call it a day. Okay, form 35, pretty straightforward. I'm going to go fast because I'm over time already. This is saying that the buyer is has an inspection contingency, which means they can back out of the contract for any reason after uh, performing an inspection. If the buyer is going to get a sewer scope, they would click May, or actually, if you leave it blank, it's automatically May. And that's saying the buyer has the right to do a sewer scope. Buyer's obligations, all inspections are to be ordered by a buyer, performed an inspection of the buyer's choice, complete at the buyer's expense, blah, 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 saying the seller is not paying for it, the buyer's paying for it. Section three is saying you have X amount of days after mutual acceptance to get the inspection response in. Okay. If you do, this is really, really, really important. If you do not get the inspection response in before 9 p.m., meaning delivered to the other brokerage and the other broker by 9 p.m. of that day, that last day, then your financing contingency is waived and you cannot back out due to the financing contingency. You cannot, as a buyer or buyer's broker, send any portion of the inspection report without the seller's permission. If you do, your, finance, your inspection contingency is waived. So very important. If the seller wants the inspection, the seller needs to, send, the listing broker needs to send you the 22, the 35 that says seller requests the buyer to provide the inspection report to the seller um, and do not send the inspection report without getting that signed by the seller and back to you. Section five is a really awesome tool that a lot of people don't know about. I almost always put like three days here because I know I can get an inspection within three days. And if the inspector says anything like, hey, you should probably have a, a professional check out the roof or you should probably have somebody check out the, the foundation or whatever, all you need to do is send them the 35R stating that you need additional time, <coughs> excuse me, and you'll get an additional five days of left blank. So that's a really awesome tool that allows you to put short days on your inspection timelines on <coughs> and automatically extend if you find things. Read this section if you're going to do it. It says you have to provide something from the inspector stating, hey, this is why we're seeking additional time. Then this six through seven explains what happens with a 35R. So it says buyer requests repairs and the seller has three days if left blank to say yes to repairs or counter you on the repairs or say no to the repairs. And the buyer has three days to accept the seller's counter off offer or back out. Really important though, section 6B, this is super, super important. If the seller and buyer do not agree to something by that third timeline, so you send an inspection response in, the seller sends an inspection response back. Now you have three days as the buyer not to send them another request like, okay, well, how about this? No, you have to have it agreed upon between you, the buyer and the seller, or else your inspection contingency is waived. So that's really, really important. It's not, you have three days, 
to get another 35R back to the seller saying, well, how about this instead? You have to have it signed around by 9 p.m. on that last third day or else your inspection contingency is waived. And then section seven is saying seller has three days for closing to have all the repairs done. That's about everything, guys. Um, that's not true. That's about 10% um, of everything. Uh, so <laughs> I hope that's helpful. If you're watching this at a later time, just note that um, every, this today is, I don't have my watch on, uh, the 2nd of December, 2021. Um, right up here in top left, it tells you the last time these forms were revised. So these forms are always being revised. So some of this may not be applicable in two months. They might change the form 35. So when you're reviewing the form, when you're reviewing any form, um, you can see up here when the past revision was, and it will tell you if it's applicable to our conversation today. But for the most part, they're not gonna change the gist of what I said, and they might just change little, little things. Like the 22A recently changed that bottom of page one. So anyways, I hope that's helpful. If you guys have any questions about this, please talk to me. Um, um, all the answers are likely in the forms, but at the same time, just because the answer is there doesn't mean it's clear. Sometimes you just need to discuss it and, um, and to help determine what the solutions are. So always feel free to contact me. If um, you ever call me and I don't answer, it's probably because I'm in a meeting. And if you're in a pinch, feel free to call or email or text Sarah because she is incredibly knowledge about this stuff too. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Sarah, for your help in this meeting. That was very insightful. That's Robin. You're Matt. welcome. Thank you, everybody. And yeah, if you have questions, text me. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.